morning. Welcome, everyone, to Williams. Good to see your smiling faces. Show those off to at least two or three people today. Go, go. I hope that you all have your bulletins open and ready. Um, there's a lot to talk about this morning, a lot coming up, a lot going on here at Williams, which is always great. If you're visiting this morning, welcome again. Um, and if you could, visitors, look at the end of your pews. There should be a little sheet of paper, slender sheet. Um, it has a couple of questions on there, just about yourself. If you could fill that out and put it in the offering plate, it'll come your way in a few minutes. So we could just have a record of your visit, because we love our visitors. Now, let's get started with an announcement, not by me, but by Handsome Scott. He has an announcement about the Crusaders and what's coming up with them. Good morning, friends and neighbors. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Um, so Saturday, October the 31st, that is JSU's homecoming day. The Crusaders are gathering here at 9 a.m. that morning to head over to uh, the lawn in front of Kinnemer Hall. It's between uh, by the Wesley Foundation there. And we're going to tailgate before the game. So if you'd like to join us, we're, we'd like to invite the entire church to come and tailgate with us and have a great time. We just ask you to bring your favorite tailgate food, and we'll gather in time of fellowship. Um, we're going to be there from about 9.30 to 12. Uh, we're going to start setting up at 9.30. The parade begins at 10.30. We're just going to walk to the end of the lawn there, watch the parade, come back, tailgate some more, and then walk over to the game together. So we'd just like to invite everybody to join us. Thanks. Thank you. Sounds like fun. All right. Look on the bulletin with me. I have a lot highlighted, so... I'll be jumping all over the place, so bear with me. Um, make sure that you come back tonight for evening worship. We will be here in the sanctuary, and we will continue our Revelation study, which was awesome. So if you missed it, that's okay. Just come back tonight, 6 o'clock. Um, next Sunday night, if you know it's that time of year where we're just going to gain weight. I'm sorry, we're just going to do it. We're just going to gain weight because we're going to eat here a lot. So next Sunday is Fall Fest. So it starts at 5 o'clock. There's a lot that's going to be going on like it is every year, but we need some help from you guys. There's going to be an area for you to trunk or treat with the kids that come. So you just need to bring your vehicle, your trunk, and some treats to go in the back. Um, and then also we're going to have uh, provided, the church will provide hot dogs, so we would like for you to bring all the fixings, desserts, soups, whatever you would like to help um, eat that night, because we'll have a lot of visitors come. So that's all going on next Sunday night. Wednesday, we will have our regular services. Starting at 530, we'll have supper. If you're wondering what's for supper, look on the back of the bulletin. And then 6.30, we have our usual Bible studies, youth activities, and children. And then uh, just know that there's a finance committee meeting at 7 o'clock, so after the service that night. This Saturday, October 24th, starting at 7 o'clock, yes, I know it's early on a Saturday, but there will be a church-wide work day. So there's some painting that's, some, that's you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. So we need your help. Be here at 7 o'clock to help out. Um, also, Bible study Tuesday has continued at 10 o'clock, so if you have nothing to do on a Tuesday at 10, come on over here to the senior adult room and be a part of the Bible study. Now, some of you have probably received already in the mail a survey to fill out. Um, I think Mel mentioned um, that to y'all past few weeks. So if you could get that filled out and turned in, that would be great. Um, this Friday, I'm going to have a fifth quarter right after the football game. So if any of y'all are interested in helping out, we're going to try to do some soups and sandwiches and such. Uh, please see me after the service and get your name signed up, especially parents. Please help me out with that this Friday. Okay, and then the big announcement is what's happening after the service this morning. Um, I know you're going to be hungry in about an hour. Great, because there's going to be food served. Um, so all of you are invited to go to our CMC and eat. Um, it's member time stewardship. So uh, there's a form for you to fill out. And, you know, if you haven't done that, then why not go eat some spaghetti and fill it out? 
Um, it's a free meal. Everyone's invited, and you have time to fill that out and get it into the nominations committee today, okay? All righty. Uh, it's time for me to hush, and it's time for you to find someone this morning to talk to, say good morning to, say you love them, kiss them on the cheek, hug their neck, shake their hand. Go for it. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning as we gather for worship on this uh, obviously fall day, right? We're, we're praying summer is behind us, at least for a little while, so our power bills can catch up. Uh, and then we look forward, as Nikki said, to that time of year where, I like that, just, just give in. If you're going to eat, it's going to be all right. And uh, there's always next year to, to lose the weight and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, but it is good to gather for worship, and as we do so, let us begin our time together with a word of prayer. Great God, we are so thankful for the chance to be here this morning, for the gift of worship that you give us, God, the chance and the time to come together with friends and neighbors, brothers and sisters, to sing songs of praise, to offer up words of prayer, to just feel your presence here with us, and to hear a word from you. So as we've gathered this morning, Lord, help us not to take this time for granted. Help us, Lord, to... Open our minds, clear, Lord, our, our vision in front of us, that we may see you, that we may hear you, that we may understand what it is you have for us this morning, that we may experience something new in your presence that changes us. So be with us now, Holy Spirit, as we continue in this time of worship, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Our scripture call this wor uh, to worship this morning comes from Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 12. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his, to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had not done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord, Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life a guilt of offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand." After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteousness servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You 
would this morning, take your hymnal and turn to 435. What, we, what a friend we have in Jesus. Let's sing all three stanzas. Please stand as we sing. Okay, let's turn over to uh, 504. He touched me, and we'll sing uh, both stanzas. <laughs>
Thank you. You be seated. How are y'all this morning? Good. Good. Ain't no Come on, buddy. I got to thinking about what 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 I might want, what we might want to talk about today, and one of my favorite and we I talked to um, some this morning. One of my favorite times of the year is this time of year, and it's one of the busiest times of the year. But I love to see the change in the seasons, and um, I'm reminded of how thankful I am. To be, to be a part of the country that I am and being a part of a place where we do get to experience all four seasons, fall, winter, spring, and summer. And we just came out of summer where it was hot, 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 and now finally coming in to the time where you're going to see all the leaves change. And, and, you know, we're coming up on Thanksgiving and Christmas and, you know, and, and you're going to hear a lot about being thankful for things. And, I, you know, and I thought I remembered... A couple of years ago, I got an email, and I think it was from Miss Chitwood back there, that came across, and it talked about making sure every day, one of the th- one thing that you do every day is to thank God, always be thankful for things, and and you know, and I want I want you to think about that. What are some things that that you're thankful for? And you don't have to tell me right now, but I want you to think about that this week and throughout throughout today, and you maybe even jot them down. Things that you're thankful for. I know. We're all thankful. I know I'm thankful for my family. Are you thankful for your family? You know, Sarah and Bryce had a birthday party yesterday, so I know they're thankful for birthdays, right? I think everybody, <laughs> some of us as we get older, we're not as quite as thankful for them because that means we're just getting older, right? <laughs> but, you know, we're thankful, and we should, we should thank God every day for the things that he's, he's blessed us with because we are very blessed. If you all look around us, everybody in the, we are, we are a very blessed congregation and blessed people. And we have to remember to be thankful for those things because there are people that are even around our world and our country and all over the place that they don't get to sit down and worship like we do. Sometimes they have to hide in places and, you know, but they're still thankful for being able to be a Christian and serve a God who lets us be free. So before we go to Children's Church this morning, I'm going to read you a little story. And it's, not, it's very simple, but it's all about thanking God. And it's just simple. And I want you to think about that. Even if you can't think of something to pray for, because I know when y'all, you're, you sit down and you say your prayers at night or even at, at the dinner table, one of the biggest things you can always do is say thank you. Two simple words, thank you. When people do things for you or when you're, you know, you're happy about something, you can say thank you. So I'm going to read this, and then we'll dismiss and go to Children's Church. And it's, it rhymes. You know, it's kind of, kind of cute. God made dark, and God made light. God made day, and God made night. Thank you, God, for all that's bright. God made sky, and God made air. God made clouds and put them there. Thank you, God. You're everywhere. God made land, and God made seas. God made the moon, and God made the sun. God then made the stars for fun. Thank you, God, for what you have done. God made fish and God made whales. God made fins and spouts and scales. Thank you, God, for such details. God made birds to fly and sing, and God made feathers, beaks, and wings. Thank you, God, for all these things. God made creatures, some with paws, some with toes, and some with claws. Thank you, God because you do not make flaws. God made people every size, gave them noses, ears, and eyes. Thank you, God. You're very wise. Thank you, God, for all you do for the world you made so new. Thanks for me and thanks for you. Thank you, God. Amen. So this week, I hope that you'll think about that. Think about the things. Look around you. Take in what's happening around you, the leaves changing, your family, things at school and what you do, and thank God every day. And don't forget to be thankful. Thank you guys for coming down here today. I think we're all going out. But the three's in. Okay.
All right, so there's no children's church for the big ones, but threes and fours, you are going with Miss Abby. Okay. Thank you. The offertory hymn this morning is 394, In My Life Be Glorified. We'll do all three stanzas. Please stand. prayer this morning. I'm going to ask that each one pray their own prayer, and I'll close us with our prayer of thanksgiving. Lord, we are thankful for your grace and for your forgiveness, Lord, and all that you give us, Lord. Just thank you so much for the body that's gathered here this morning and just pray that the offerings we take up will be used for the uh, better furtherance of your kingdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. In Mark chapter 10, we'll be reading verses 35 through 45 this morning. <coughs> I'm afraid with fall and the cooler temperatures comes all those scratchy allergies. Get in the back of yourself. I just love to do that. I'm not having a stroke. I hope. Um, just a little, little scratch in the back of the throat. Mark chapter 10, we'll begin with verse 35 and read to verse 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him, to Jesus, and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Would you pray with me? Lord, now we ask that you speak to us the words of Holy Scripture. The words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart may be pleasing to you. And the meditation of all of our hearts may be pleasing. That you give us ears to hear, Lord. Hear your words that speak to us and change us more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus our friend, our Lord, and our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. That's what it says just a few, text, or a few verses before our text this morning in verse 32 there of chapter 10 of Mark's Gospel. They were on the road 
going up to Jerusalem. Jesus, in the very next verse, reiterates this uh, understanding. He says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. You always went up to Jerusalem. Even if you jumped out of a helicopter, you went up to Jerusalem. It was an important place, a high place. And going to Jerusalem meant one thing for these disciples. It meant one thing for Jesus and the whole group that followed him. It meant that things were getting serious. Jesus and the disciples had been on the road or on the way ever since the beginning of Mark's gospel, on the way to Jerusalem. They made brief stops. Jesus, first of all, to call some disciples, some fishermen here, a tax collector there, some other folks over there. They stopped every once in a while to heal the sick, to tell a few parables, for Jesus to answer a few gotcha questions from the media. But now, now they were really on the way on the way up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the city of David, the city where the temple was, the center of Jewish religious and cultural life. Jerusalem was the location where where Rome had decided, we better put our governor here, because that's where all the trouble might start. Jerusalem was, for us, the big city, the place where things happened, where the powerful were, where commerce took place. Jerusalem was the place to go. If you were going to make a pumped-up political protest, it was the place to go. If you were going to make a a march of military might, it was the place you were going to go. If you were going to have a demonstration of defiance against doctrinal uh, recommendations from the religious folk. See, Jesus said, we are going up to Jerusalem. And I'm quite sure that when the disciples heard this, some of them got excited. Some Some of them maybe got nervous. Some of them probably were anxious because going up to Jerusalem meant one thing. Stuff was about to get real. Now, I'm sure they all had different ideas about what it meant for things to get real. I'm sure some of them, some of them heard that when Jesus said, all right, y'all, we're going up to Jerusalem, they heard a rallying cry. They heard a cry to lace up their boots, sharpen their bayonets and load the guns. They were finally about to get this revolt started. They were finally about to march in and march Rome out. They'd waited long enough. They watched Jesus and his little campaign with all the, all the common folk, you know, going around, healing, teaching, doing all these miracles. But we're going up to Jerusalem. It's time to kick out the oppressors. Time to give the people the leader they deserve, not a spoiled aristocrat, not a Roman puppet. That's right, let's go! Let's go up to Jerusalem. Get this show on the road. I'm sure it's what some of them thought. Then again, maybe some of them had other ideas about what it meant to go up to Jerusalem. Perhaps they knew Jerusalem was the place of religious centrality. And so maybe they saw Jerusalem and Jesus was called to go up there as a place where Jesus would finally call out all those reprobate priests, all those corrupt clergy, ruining the religion of the temple. Maybe they thought that Jesus was going to lead a religious reformation, his version of the 95 Theses in his hand, to nail on the temple door to get things right, to set things in the order they were supposed to be, to install a new faithful order to the machinery of the temple. Let's go up to Jerusalem, Jesus said. And so they thought, now we can finally have a religion that does things the right way, our way. I'm willing to bet there were all kinds of opinions when Jesus said, See, we're going up to Jerusalem. But it seems pretty clear that for at least two of his disciples, it meant that Jesus was about to shift a gear, to go from just being a a prophet, a teacher, a healer around town, to being someone who was going to step up into a place of honor, a place of power and of glory. And so they wanted to be sure That when that happened, that they got their place right alongside him. They wanted to get their piece of the pie. After all, their piece should be bigger. They were with him, you know, really longer than most. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, or really I like it better, the sons of thunder. I like to imagine them with tattoos on their arms that say sons of thunder. Because that's what I'd have done. Sons of thunder. They came forward to Jesus and said, teacher... We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. 
Husbands, have you ever said that to your wives? Wives, you ever said it to your You ever said it to anybody? We want you to do whatever it is we ask of you. That, that's, that's bold, right? That's gumption, as we say. It's either a bold demand to say, all right, give us what we want, or it's a bold sign of faith. After all, think of all the people who would come up and say, uh, Jesus, I, I have a daughter uh, who's sick, and I know, I know you can heal her. So will you heal her? I have a servant at home. I didn't bring him with me. He's at home. He's sick. He's about to die. Can you heal him? Think of all the people who came up to Jesus. Jesus, I want to know right now. Tell me. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Maybe James and John are being arrogant. Maybe they're being faithful. Either way, Jesus doesn't rebuke them. He just says, all right, what is it you want me to do? I wonder, I wonder if James and John, when Jesus said that, if they were stunned. Like two little brothers, right, who conspire together. We're going to ask Mama if we can have ice cream for supper. And they go up to Mama. Mama, can we have ice cream for supper? And she says, no, child, go away. I'm fixing broccoli. You, 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 go away. Don't ask for ice cream. She says, oh, yeah, what flavor? I mean, really, do you have a response after that? Jesus says, well, okay, what is it you want me to do for you? And their response, grant us. Notice the, the language, even in modern translations, isn't nice. It isn't, it isn't southern, right? We'd say, oh, well, bless your heart, Jesus. If you'd be so sweet to let us. Do. No, they say, let us, grant us, give us to sit. One at your right hand and one at your left hand. Not at the dinner table but in your glory. As if they said, look, we know we're heading up to Jerusalem. We know stuff's about to get real. We're not really sure what it's going to look like. Maybe you're going to take over the temple. Maybe you're just going to take over the town. Maybe you're about to take over the whole world. We don't really know. But when it happens, when it's all over and the dust settles, we kind of like to sit next to you. We want to be second and third in line. Now think about that. The nerve it must have taken to do that, right? The gall to ask to be second and third after Jesus. To sit in the place of privilege. In verse 41, we're told that the disciples, the disciples hear James and John ask us, and they get angry. They're angry because of their inappropriate request. But you know, right? You know, they ain't angry because it was inappropriate. You know they're not mad because they're like, I cannot believe James and John would ask Jesus such. No, that ain't why they're mad. You know why they're mad. Because they didn't think of it first. Or maybe, maybe they were like, you know, if you've ever wanted a promotion at work and you're waiting because the boss has been in a mood, somebody's been angry, and, you know, it's been a rough week, a rough quarter, so you don't go in. And then somebody goes into the boss's office and asks for the promotion you wanted, and they get it, and now it's not there for you to get, and you're mad at them because you didn't think to go in there first. That's what happened. And notice James and John didn't say, hey, could you have six chairs on either side? Let all 12 of us who've been here with you, can we sit? No, we want two seats. That's why they're mad. That's why they're angry. They didn't think of it first. James and John beat it to them. The gumption of their request for such a thing from Jesus only angers the disciples. But if I'm honest with you, it irritates me too. It irritates those of us who've read this story down through the ages. Those of us who've had to witness in this text two disciples, along with the rest of them, who continue to miss the point, to not get it. And we know, we know they missed the point because Jesus, as only Jesus could do, because I sure couldn't say it this way, says to them in verse 38, you do not know what you were asking. Now, if I'm honest with you, it seems pretty clear to me they know what they're asking. They want to be the Messiah's pets. They want to be second and third. They want, when Jesus comes into this power, to have all the honor and power and glory and luxuries for themselves that come along with it. But Jesus says you don't know what you're asking. So if they don't know what they're asking, then that begs the question for me, what are they asking? What are they getting wrong? What is it they don't get? I mean, I'm sure James and John, yeah, it's the first century. I'm sure they still know their right from their left. And I often wonder what that conversation was like, right? Any of you have brothers, have siblings? You know that conversation probably went something like this. Well, who's going to be second? Well, I'm the oldest. Yeah, but I've been, I'm the hardest working. You know they probably had that conversation. But here they are. What is it that they don't get right? 
It seems pretty clear they want to sit on either side. So why is it that they don't know what they're asking? Do you suppose that they misunderstood what Jesus meant by his glory? Do you suppose that's where they got wrong? The meaning of Jesus' glory, what it's going to look like, what it's going to be like. Perhaps, perhaps they had images of Jesus in royal robes, right? Seated on a golden throne in the lavish Roman palaces of the day. Right? You can almost see them, right? Imagining Jesus in the most splendid priestly garments, a silk turban, bejeweled breastplate, standing in front of the most uh, a shining golden altar, offering the best and purest sacrifices to God. And who's there handing it to him? James and John. Maybe, maybe they imagined him in a chariot, decked out in a royal suit of armor, Helmet on his head, triumphant over his enemies. And what's there in the chariot? Oh, space for two more? James and John. Better still, I wonder, I wonder if they had in mind those images of the glittering mosaics in the grand cathedrals of this world. Those majestic masterpieces that are sometimes painted on plaster or on stretched canvas. Those triumphant images of the Christ enthroned in the clouds, angels surrounding Him, His scarlet robes spilling out of heaven onto the earth. Are those great works depicting Jesus seated on a rainbow with a book of Scripture in one hand and making the sign of blessing in the other? Or what about those Sunday school pictures? You've all seen them. White-robed Jesus, powerful light bursting forth from his presence in the midst of some anonymous temple with fine Corinthian columns going down the way, right? What if James and John had those pictures in their mind? Our pictures of Christ's glory in their minds. Would they still misunderstand what they were asking? Would they still misunderstand Jesus' glory? Do we misunderstand it? Jesus asks these two brothers. He says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink from the same cup that I'll drink from? Can you be baptized with the same baptism with which I'm baptized? And maybe, maybe they thought he meant, can you drink out of the same cup or are you afraid of cooties at the dinner table? Can you be baptized with the same baptism? Yeah, we were there at the Jordan. You saw us. We were baptized just like you. We were in line right there at the Jordan when John was baptized. And you know we've been baptized just like you. So they say, yeah, we can do it. We're able. But when Jesus refers to the cup that he's going to drink, it's not a chalice. It's not a goblet. It's not a styrofoam cup from Zaxby's. He's referring to the symbolic cup of suffering. And the baptism. Baptism is a strange word in the early church. When we think about it, we think about like what we'll do next week, right? Fill up the baptistry and go through water in the symbolic act that unites us with Christ. And that's exciting. In the early church, baptism was often talked about as martyrdom. A blood baptism. Suffering. David Garland even says maybe Jesus uses the word baptism to say that he's going to be immersed in this suffering. I don't know what you think, but to me, that doesn't sound an awful lot like glory. And maybe James and John don't yet understand the fullness of Christ's glory. Maybe they don't fully understand that the kingdom of God, that the kingdom that Christ is bringing with him, maybe they don't understand what that's like. What if we don't? What if we don't fully understand it either? I mean, think about it. The disciples become angry with James and John because they ask Jesus these things. But upon witnessing their anger, Jesus calls them all together and says, All right, listen, you know, you know that among the Gentiles, those they recognize as rulers, they lord it over them, right? They oppress them. They make them struggle. They're great ones. They're tyrants over them. And then he says these words. If you write in your Bible, you can underline it. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave, not to the rest of them, not to the 11 others, not to just the people in this crowd, not just to the people who are following us, not just to the people who are going to accept me later, not just to the people, la, la, to who? All. 
He said very similar words just a few verses earlier in verse 31 when he says, Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Last. Servant, the Greek word's diakonos. Slave, the Greek word there is doulos, so they're two different things. Last, servant, slave. Those aren't words that I think about when I think about glory. No, no, no. I think about words like first, master, throne, crown, king, being served. But Jesus says the right opposite. The right opposite. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 45, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. And that word many sometimes gets kicked around in controversies between especially Calvinistic folks and others, but it's likely a Semitism, which means people in that area, to say all. It's at least a lot. Even him. Even the Messiah falls to the bottom of the list as a servant. The one who would go so far as to give his life for all of those under him, rather than commanding all of those under them to give his life for them, for him. That's not glory. That's not what people aspire to. That's not what kings hope for, to go marching out first and say, I'm going to die so that the nation can live. No, it's, I'm going to send out an army so that maybe I can get by and get reelected next year. Or maybe next time this will happen and everything will be safe. That's not what people do. That's not glory. It's not especially what we want glory to be. We want glory to be clean. We want glory to be a comfortable paradise. A nice house on a hill, new shoes on our feet, bleached white robes on our back. We want glory to be easygoing. To be at the top of the heap with others looking up at us, wishing they could be like us, wishing they could have what we have. Glory is supposed to be about streets paved with precious metals, crowns, and thrones. Glory isn't supposed to involve all this slaving. It's not supposed to be about serving. And it sure isn't supposed to be about dying. Glory is supposed to be a picture of a shining kingdom. Filled with the robed righteous, all gathered together in one place, probably around a throne, while the damned wallow in eternal torment beneath us. That's what glory is supposed to look like. That's what we've been told that glory is supposed to look like. That if we're patient, if we're saved, if we're good Christian people, and we've been told to expect it, if we're all these things, then that's what's going to happen. That's what glory is. And then... That becomes the very reason we say we have faith in the first place. You know, when I think about it, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. I don't think I'm not too unlike James and John. I think I'm a lot like James and John in their request to Jesus to have a place beside him in what I think is his glory. Because I know when I first came to think of myself as a Christian, it was because I was convinced that the only way to stay out of eternal pain and torment and hell and damnation and all that stuff was to say a sinner's prayer, to walk the aisle, and, and to be baptized. I was always saying, you don't have to be baptized, but you probably should be. That's why I called myself a Christian. To make sure I kept myself out of hell, secure a spot in heaven and glory where everything would be nice. I was told after all that, that was the most important thing, to keep myself out of hell, to make sure I went to heaven when I died. But then I began to actually read the Bible, the New Testament, the words of Jesus, and I realized something. If the only reason I was a Christian was to make sure I didn't go to hell, to make sure that I got to go to heaven... That sounded pretty selfish. And as I read the words of Jesus, something occurs to me. Jesus isn't really a fan of selfishness. He seems to always be calling other people to service, to loving others, to putting others ahead of themselves and to putting ourselves at the bottom of the pile, at the end of the list putting ourselves last in line. Really, if I want to get radical about it, putting ourselves in hell so others may experience the joy 
of God. It seems to me that I've been truly mistaken about Christ's glory for most of my Christian life. Because, you see, I used to believe that Christ's glory was only found in this sort of heaven, perhaps on a throne surrounded by angels and all the righteous singing eternal praises. And I don't doubt that's part of it at some point. But then I read Christ's words in Scripture. And I see where Christ is headed, going up to Jerusalem, where His kingdom is arriving, where it's growing. And I realize that perhaps Jesus' glory isn't found in the ethereal paradise of my imagination. Do you know where it's found? Christ's glory is found on the cross with the rejected, the outcast, the criminals on his right and left. Did you notice that? It's not James and John at his right and left. Two people who don't even know their names. Just criminals, bandits. I realize that I feel more joy, more of the presence of Christ, more closely connected to the kingdom when I am serving alongside brothers and sisters to help others. Those of you in this room, you know what I'm talking about. Do you feel more connected to Christ when you're swinging a hammer to help somebody build a house after it's been torn down, after it's been gone? Do you feel more connected to Christ when you're working alongside others, bagging food to send to children when they go home on the weekends? Or do you feel closer to Christ when you're sitting on a beach in paradise? I don't know about you, but I feel closer to the kingdom of God when I'm working and serving with brothers and sisters. And maybe, maybe that's what the kingdom of heaven is. I'm beginning to think that the kingdom of God looks more like all of God's children coming together to serve one another, seeking to outdo one another in love, than it looks like those old pictures of clouds, robes, and pearly gates. I'm beginning to think that the sweet by and by is made all the more sweeter as we come together in love with God to wipe away the tears by God's help from one another's eyes. To strive to put each other first. As we seek to be the very followers that Christ has called us to be in the first place, the people that the Spirit empowers us to be. When we think or say we want to be a follower of Christ, when we say we want to be a Christian, and we think that only means comfort in the afterlife, a crown in heaven, a place in glory, then I'm I'm afraid we fail. We fail to grow and learn that the calling of Christ is one of mutual service and love. A call to be a slave To all. And that word means all. Not just other Christians, not just those we like, but everybody, even those who don't meet our approval. When we think faith is just about securing comfort for ourselves after we die and not serving and loving others now, then I'm afraid we'll hear Jesus say, You do not know what you are asking. So may we come to see the glory of God's kingdom unfolding before us right now, this very day. And may you seek to live into that glory through service and love to both God and all of those with whom you cross paths. And if today you wish to join on that journey towards glory, the great kingdom work to which Christ calls us, if you wish to follow Jesus in this life of selfless love, then I invite you to respond to that calling, that urging on your heart to join with Jesus, to follow him. It's not easy. It's not always comfortable. And it always, almost always, means carrying a cross. So may you come. May you listen to Jesus as he calls us all forward, all on this journey together into his glory. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, whose glory is found in the suffering of the cross, in the service of giving your life as a ransom for us. Help us, Lord, to not think selfishly of ourselves, but to empty ourselves a little more every day. To hear your voice calling us to service, to slavery to one another. Help us, Lord, to 
draw closer to your glory and see what it truly is to witness the kingdom working all around us, growing within us, through us, and around us. And Holy Spirit, now call us. Call us and give us the power, Lord, the, the courage to respond to your call that we may join you on the way. Be with us now, we pray, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. The invitation hymn this morning is hymn 409. I know who I believe it. I'll sing the first and second stanzas. Please, please stand. May you go with the grace of God the Father, love of Christ the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit out from this place, going up to your own Jerusalem, following the call of Christ who calls us all into his glory. Would you pray with me? Lord God, go with us now as we go out from this place and into the world. May we hear you calling us. May we see you going before us. And may we be faithful in responding to your call. In your holy name we pray. Amen.